Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This is a YouTube video, obviously, on the laws governing the 2020 presidential election and the electoral vote counting process. I am T. Greg Doucette. Tell you a little bit more about myself in a minute, but wanted to briefly tell you about why this video exists. It is because I am mostly a Twitter guy, and people kept sending me a YouTube video from Van Jones. They sent me another one from Fareed Zakaria sending me a sort of videos panicking about how the election is going to turn out, telling me that Donald Trump is going to end up getting a second term. That is not true. It is not going to happen. So after explaining on Twitter repeatedly how that all worked, I decided that it might be easier just to put everything together into a PowerPoint presentation. It's actually a keynote. I'm a Mac user, uh, but then load it onto YouTube so that folks can share it as they see fit. So we titled it, Van Jones is wrong because Van Jones' TED Talk YouTube video is the one that I got sent the most, but it's not just him. I mean, he's a, he's a lawyer from Yale, so I, I kind of blame him a little bit, but a lot of other people have been repeating the same wrong stuff. So I'm going to give you all of the information, share it with your friends as you see fit, and then hopefully that will calm things down on Twitter a little bit. All right, so let's go over what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you a few disclaimers because I'm a lawyer. Lawyers love disclaimers. I'm also going to tell you a little bit about myself. And then I'm going to tell you why you should listen to me and also what laws are going to govern the count. And then we have what's called how things play out, where I basically run through a bunch of bona fide actual hypotheticals that people have been sending me on Twitter and how that would actually happen if we try to go down that particular path in 2021. And then at the end, I give you my contact information. Spoiler, it's really just the link to Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Okay, so first, disclaimers. This is probably going to end up being not safe for work. I don't know that for sure. Uh, there is no profanity in the presentation, but I do tend to cuss a lot. So it's probably not a good idea to play this at work if sharing a YouTube video of a lawyer using profanity could potentially get you fired. So take that as the first disclaimer. Second, almost everything in this presentation is text. You're gonna hear why in a minute, but there are very few pictures. I think I've only got one picture, one table, uh, and then pictures in my bio, which don't really count. So just know there's going to be a lot of text here. It will be me reading a lot of text. And three, it's boring as shit. Uh, well, never mind. I just hit the NSFW part. It's very boring. Reality is boring. The laws governing how the government works are boring. The fact that we have had a reality TV show for our government for the past four years, I think has gotten people to think reality is not boring, in fact, reality is very, very boring. So this presentation is going to be boring unless you are actively interested in this type of stuff. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a native of Virginia. I was born in Fredericksburg. I was raised in Virginia Beach for my entire life. I now live in Durham, North Carolina with my wife and three kids. Kids are in quotation marks because they are actually pets. We have a dog named Chance and then two cats, one named Biscuit and another named Oliver. I came to North Carolina back in 1998 to go to college. I graduated from NC State University in 2009 with my degree in computer science. That picture you see on the screen is basically how I oriented my life for most of my existence from 1998 when I moved here uh, until yeah, pretty much now, honestly. Uh, you could tell from the years I did not finish all at once. I dropped out. After uh, two years at state, I couldn't afford it, dropped out, was homeless for a stretch, worked for five years, finally came back in 2005, graduated in 2009, and decided to go to law school, or I went to the North Carolina Central University School of Law here in Durham. This is a picture of me during 1L orientation. Yes, I wore a suit because someone told me that was expected. I was one of the only people wearing a suit. And you can actually tell I still have a little bit of hair in that picture. Most of it has stopped growing back, at least on the top. After I graduated, I started my own law firm. I have been practicing law in my own firm for eight years now. We focus on criminal defense and on constitutional law. So that ends up being a lot of times First Amendment stuff. If you happen to be arrested for protesting, we will help defend you. If you happen to be sued for defamation, we will help defend you. I do a lot of constitutional law stuff. Okay, I'm also, as a spoiler, a conservative. I am a former Republican. I was a Republican since before I could vote. I voted for George H.W. Bush and the kids vote thing in elementary school uh, and then have been a Republican up until 2016. I was the vice chairman for the Wake County Republican Party. 
I was a candidate in 2016 for the state Senate as a Republican. I shared the ballot with Donald Trump. But when he got elected, I realized that we were going to have this utter dumpster fire over the past four years, and I decided to, uh, to call it quits. So I left the Republican Party in November of 2016. I have been unaffiliated for the past four years ever since. So that's me. Big question. Why should you listen to me? And the answer is, surprise, you shouldn't. Listening to me is a terrible idea. You don't know anything about me except what I just told you. All you know is that I'm a lawyer with a video on YouTube. And folks, YouTube is where legal knowledge goes to die. There are a few exceptions. If you're subscribed to Legal Eagle, he's entertaining and he gets the law right. But the fact is, a lot of this stuff is garbage. It is absolute garbage. You have people who don't know what they're talking about putting out videos because they can add slick effects, they look good on camera, they think they're going to sway you with the passion of their voice, even as they tell you utter fucking bullshit. Okay? As an example, Van Jones' TED Talk video spends a lot of time telling you about the 12th Amendment. We're going to get into that in a minute. Panicked a bunch of people. Folks are scared. And it turns out it's all bupkis. It's all garbage. It's not just him. Fareed Zakaria as well. Several others. Even Jonathan Last, if you happen to be a Bulwark subscriber, he's a conservative. He's very smart. But he says a lot of the same stuff that Van Jones says, even though it's not going to happen. So you should not listen to me. What you should do is listen to experts who put things in writing. And I'm going to help you out because in the notes to this video are links to three different experts that have thought through all of this stuff that we're going to talk about on this video. I've got someone from the Congressional Research Service. Those are the folks who actually train Congress on what the law is and how this all works. There is a law professor who has thought through this and pieced together a very good law review article from a year ago that covers this exact same stuff. And I've got someone from kind of the commercial law pundit space, an entry from the Lawfare blog. All three of these happen to say pretty much the same thing just with different degrees of detail, but I'm going to link them to you. So if you decide that I do not look as good as Van Jones, if I do not sound as good as Fareed Zakaria, or if you're annoyed that I'm wearing a t-shirt or whatever, you can cut this video off, go to those links, and read everything right now. All right, so with all of that out of the way, I want you to remember a few key points. Number one, Donald Trump lost the election. And that's so important, I need to emphasize it, Donald Trump lost the election. It was not close. Joe Biden won the largest percent of the popular vote against an incumbent president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran against Herbert Hoover in 1932. He is surpassed when Reagan beat Carter. He's surpassed when Carter beat Ford. You have to go back to the 1930s to find an outsider candidate running against an incumbent who got a larger portion of the popular vote. Now, we put together this video on November 14th. As of that date, these are the voting margins in the six key battleground states. You'll notice all of them are at least in the five figures. Michigan is in six figures, 147,000 votes. The single largest change in an electoral margin in American history is only 667 votes. So after we get through counting all the votes, recounting all the votes, suing over all the votes, at the end of the day, Donald Trump lost the election. He lost the popular vote, he lost the electoral vote, and we don't put losers like that in the White House. There is no one weird trick that leads to a Republican president. It does not exist, it cannot happen. I don't care what anyone else on YouTube tells you, what anyone on Twitter tells you, what anyone on TV tells you. It will not, cannot happen under our current system of government. So let's get into it. When you're dealing with the law, we have what is called our rules of FISC. I have a podcast called FISC em All. You'll see it linked if you go to my Twitter page. And as part of that, we have five rules. Rule number two is to start at the source whenever you're analyzing any kind of legal question. Power in this country is vested in the people. As part of that, we formed states. The people give up a little bit of their power to the states. At the time of the American Revolution, there were 13 free, sovereign, independent states. You might have learned about the Articles of Confederation. That was the 13 states being treated similar to the European Union of today, where they each had the power to kind of do their own thing with a little bit of, of interoperability between them. But for the most part, they were separate. That didn't work. That was a terrible setup. So in 1787, we ratified what is now the United States Constitution. We have the longest governing document, the longest lasting out of any modern country. 
And as part of the reason why I put this in this pyramid is that the power shrinks as you get further up to the top. The federal government has less power than the state governments, even though people don't believe that it's true. But the things that each thing does, the folks beneath it on the pyramid can't undo it. So the people can't really undo what a state decides to do unless you put in new state legislators, new governors. Likewise, the states cannot do what the Constitution says the federal government does. Under Article 5, the Supremacy Clause, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and there's no way for a state to overturn a federal action if the Constitution says the federal government gets to do that particular thing. All of that matters when it comes to elections. So there are four constitutional provisions that we're going to talk about. The first one is Article 1, Section 5. This gives Congress the power to determine the uh, qualifications of its membership, making sure that representatives elect are properly elected. And it gives them the power to determine how their own houses proceed, their own rules of conduct. Article 2, Section 1. This is the Elections and Electors Clause. This lays out the state responsibilities for running an election, and the Congress's responsibilities for running that particular election, what they can do. You have the 12th Amendment, which covers changes to the original Constitution, how that process works. And then you have the 20th Amendment that deals with the terms of office and when Donald Trump was leaving. Okay? Now, as part of those powers, this is the initial divvying up of power. The states have given up certain autonomy to the federal government, and the federal government, as part of the Constitution, gets to do certain things. Congress has enacted statutes. One of those is called the Electoral Count Act, using their powers under Article 2, Section 1. Another one is the Presidential Succession Act, using their powers under the 20th Amendment. We're going to talk about all of this stuff during this video. So, talking about the 12th Amendment... Ignore my bad lip syncing there. If, if you have heard of Hamilton, you have heard of the concept of a contingent election. This is where the House actually decides the president when Electoral College does not. Okay, Everyone is talking about this particular amendment because it's an easy thing to grab onto. We know what contingent elections are. And I'm dressing this first. I'm putting the 12th Amendment out of order from what I just told you because the idea that the 12th Amendment matters uh, is, is kind of bogus because everyone is focusing on the contingent election process. This is part quoted here, where if there's a tie in the Electoral College or no candidate gets a majority of the electors appointed, the House makes the choice. And in that scenario, each state only gets one vote. And since Republicans have a majority in more states than Democrats in Congress, everyone goes, oh my God, it's a coup. That has been the focus of Van Jones's video. It's the focus of Fareed Zakaria's video. It's the focus of everything you have seen, with very few exceptions, that this is going to end somehow in a contingent election in the House and the Republicans are going to win because they have something like 28 states to Democrats, 22 or some such. Okay? Spoiler, it's not a coup because you're not going to have a contingent election. And if you do, the Democrats are going to find a way to win it. And I'm going to tell you how. So first, if it's obvious that you're going to have a contingent election, we're going to know this on December 14th. Let's say 37 electors flip from Biden to Trump so that you end up with an electoral college tie. The House has the power to delay swearing in the Republicans. I'm going to Get to that in a minute. I know you think that's crazy. I promise you it is true, and we have had Supreme Court litigation on it already. That's option one. You stack the deck. Option two is you just never have a contingent election because Congress has to count the votes before you find out if anyone has a majority or not. Under the 12th Amendment, you have a contingent election. If no one has a majority, well, how will you know if they don't have a majority if you don't count the votes? It seems obvious, but a lot of people just kind of skip past that. Okay? So, Article 1, Section 5. This is the first way to short-circuit a contingent election. You stack who is allowed to vote. All right? Each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute a quorum. Now, the way that works is that when the Congress meets, the clerks from the previous Congress call everyone to order, 
make sure there's a quorum of people. They are a majority of the 435. And then they split. There's a Republican caucus, a Democrat caucus. They meet amongst themselves of who they want to be the speaker. And then they go through the list. And they end up shouting out who they want a speaker. And whoever the speaker is wins. They're moved up to the dais to be sworn in. They get sworn in first. Now, normally on the first day of Congress, after the speaker is sworn in, they then swear in all of the other representatives elect. The candidates, the people that are not yet representatives. And that's the sequence. House speaker always gets sworn in first. Then the house speaker swears in everyone else. Now, what happens if Pelosi decides, well, you know, Republicans are saying they got elected via voter fraud. You know, the same ballots that were fraudulent for Joe Biden must have been fraudulent for these Republican Congress critters. What if I take that at face value? Shouldn't I at least investigate? She has the power to do that. And if you think that's crazy, this has already happened. All right, so in the case of Powell versus McCormick, it was decided in 1969, but it started a long time before then. All right, Adam Powell was a representative in New York. He was elected in 1966. And after all of the other Congress people were sworn in, Powell was pulled off to the side. And the House said, we're not going to swear you in because you're involved in a lot of scandal. He had embezzled some money. He was under investigation. And the House didn't want to have that. So he never got sworn in for that term. Powell sued. Powell sued saying, look, the Constitution specifies the qualifications to serve in Congress. You have to be a citizen for a certain number of years. You have to live in your district for a certain number of years. You have to be a minimum age. And you have to be elected by the people of the state in accordance with the laws of that particular state. And he said, by saying I can't be sworn in because of this particular scandal, the House is basically creating a new qualification, a new way of saying, I can't be here, even though I met the minimum requirements. And his argument basically was that the proper remedy in that scenario is for two-thirds of the House to expel him, which they can do. It's not impeachment and expulsion like a normal federal official. Each chamber can kick anyone out with a two-thirds vote. And the Supreme Court agreed. So it was a seven to one to one decision. One justice didn't participate, one dissented. The other seven said, okay, Powell is right. He should have been sworn in because they were creating this particular uh, new clause, if you will, where being involved in a scandal meant that you couldn't be you know, in Congress. As part of that, Congress enacted what is now the Federal Contested Elections Act which lays out the process for challenging someone's election. Now, keep in mind, Powell won, but there are two key points here. One, it took Powell three years to win. He filed in early 77. He won in late 79. And so that entire 77, 78 congressional cycle, he never was in office. So that delay of litigation became a problem. In addition to that, Even though the Supreme Court said you can't create new qualifications, one of the pre-existing qualifications is that a representative has to be elected by the citizens of that state according to their laws. Voter fraud, being elected by dead people or people who are not allowed to vote, which is what Republicans are claiming, is one of those particular qualifications that already exists in the Constitution. So what Pelosi could do is file a claim under the Federal Contested Elections Act. It gets referred to the House Committee on Administration, and they can investigate. They don't have to investigate long. They can just wait four or five days and decide that everything is fine. But they can shunt that off to the side, and you end up, for a little while, with an all-Democrat House. So the end result there is that you end up with President Joe Biden, because if there's a contingent election and it's only Democrats voting, it doesn't matter who has more states because the Democrats have 50 state delegations. All right. That's not going to happen because that is a true nuclear option. They could do it. It's constitutional. It's already been ruled on. But we're not going to get to that point. The more likely scenario, if anything were to happen, is that the vote just gets delayed. That's the second way you stop a contingent election is just by delaying it indefinitely. And as part of that, You go back to the uh, Article 1, Section 5. Each house determines the rules of its own proceedings. And bear in mind, this is an explicit plenary power of Congress. The Supreme Court cannot weigh in. It has zero influence. 
any litigation over it is what is called a political question that they can't do anything about. And if you doubt that, there's another case. It's called Nixon versus United States. This is not the president. This is actually a judge who was impeached and removed. And he filed suit saying, hey, my impeachment trial was not fair. And the Supreme Court unanimously said, sorry, bud, doesn't matter. What they said was that whenever there is a textually demonstrable constitutional commitment of the particular issue to a coordinate political department, in this case, the legislature or the executive, if the Constitution says these folks have the power to handle this, it doesn't matter at all whether or not someone wants to sue over it. There is nothing the Supreme Court itself can do. The Supreme Court cannot force the House to adjust its rules. They cannot force the House to meet, cannot force the House to vote. They don't have that power. Because Article 1, Section 5 gave that power to each house. So let's say the Supreme Court even tried. Let's say the Supreme Court told the house, you got to change your house rules. What the house would tell them to do is to fuck off. They would tell them to pound sand, and there's nothing the Supreme Court can do. They're not going to arrest the Speaker of the House because the house decides that they're not going to take action. There's absolutely nothing the Supreme Court can do in that particular scenario. And this ties in with Congress's vote counting powers under the 12th Amendment and the statute of the Electoral Count Act. I'll tell you why in a minute. So let's get into Article 2, Section 1. This is the Elections and Electors Clause. So this piece here lays out that the states determine how the electors are appointed. That's their job. They determine the method of appointment. That's why for most states, it's winner take all. But for Nebraska and Maine, they decided they want to do it proportionally, where the winner of each congressional district gets an elector, and then the winner of the state gets two electors. They're allowed to do that because the Constitution gives that power to the states. But it also says Congress gets to determine when the electors have to be appointed. That's their job. What day do you have to decide you're going to have presidential electors? And as part of enacting that, using that power under Article 2, Section 1, you get the Electoral Count Act. This is codified in 3 USC, it stands for United States Code, Sections 1 through 17. Now, this was enacted in 1887 after the Hayes-Tilden election. If you have you know, took AP U.S. history, you might have heard of the Compromise of 1877, where the Republicans got the presidency in exchange for ending Reconstruction and letting the Democrats take over the South. This was back before the party switched. So as part of this particular election, the election, you know, the presidency presidency was basically stolen. Tilden won the popular vote and arguably would have had more electoral votes. But there was a dispute over several states had sent basically competing slates of electors where one said, this is our slate, and then another group said, no, this is actually the state's slate. And prior to the Electoral Count Act, you had what is called the 22nd Joint Rule, where the Houses of Congress said, we don't need laws. We are the sole arbiters of electoral votes, and we're just throwing out Democrat electoral votes left and right, and if you're a state and you don't like that, fuck you. There's nothing you can do about it. That was how things started. The Electoral Count Act was designed to be a compromise so that the states could resolve their voting disputes, and then there's a deadline where as long as their disputes are resolved by that deadline, their slates will count, and then you get into Congress's internal rules about counting. Uh, This is designed to basically give a nod to states' rights in a nutshell. It has been used for every single presidential election since 18. 87. So Harrison Cleveland in 88, all the way through Trump v. Clinton in 2016, the Electoral Count Act has laid out the process. This is a very old law that's been used for years. All right. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole law. I'm going to give you the link to it so that you can go through it. Because remember, you want to look at written stuff as opposed to listening to a guy on YouTube. But there are parts of it we're going to go over. Part one is the setting of the deadline. Electors have to be chosen by Election Day, the Tuesday next after the first Monday in November. That's when slates of electors have to be chosen. And what happens in terms of picking those slates, the political parties coordinate with the candidates and pick who their electors are going to be. These folks aren't chosen by the legislatures. The political parties pick them ahead of time, months ahead of time, so that when you vote for the candidate, you're actually picking their slate of electors and usually some alternates as well. Okay? 
you might be wondering, okay, fine. So if we're electing electors on election day, how do you do that if there are potential problems? You know, we're now, what, two weeks after election day, give or take, and some states haven't even finished counting. Well, part of the Electoral Count Act provides for that. In Section 5, you have this block of text, which basically says that as long as by a certain date you have resolved any issues you've got, you've handled litigation, you've handled recounts, you handle all that business, by this particular date and time, we're going to pretend you actually chose someone on Election Day. This is called the safe harbor deadline. You've probably heard about it if you've been keeping up with this stuff. There's a safe harbor date. This year, it's December 8th. It's six days before the Electoral College meets. As long as a state has finished everything before the safe harbor, we're going to assume that their slate of electors is proper. Okay? So, continuing on, what happens if a state does not finish by the safe harbor deadline, whatever reason, because of litigation or fraud or whatever, they don't get a delegation in place by December 6th. The Electoral Count Act provides for that. It allows the legislature to appoint folks, which is another reason why everyone says it's a coup. Everyone just assumes that Georgia is going to pick their own electors because they have a Republican legislature. Pennsylvania is going to pick their own electors because they have a Republican legislature. And then all of this is going to happen and Donald Trump is going to steal the election from Joe Biden. Spoiler, still no, it's not a coup. It's not going to happen. And the reason why is that you get into Section 15 of the Electoral Count Act, which lays out the rules for counting everything. Now, I've put here it's densely written, and that's why. This, this is the actual Section 15. Again, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to give you the link so you can read it. It is the longest section by far. It's a bit tough to parse out because it's basically like two or three long sentences with a bunch of semicolons in between. But if you go through it a section at a time, it actually makes a lot of sense. And the links that I give you to the Congressional Research Service, that law professor I mentioned, they also explain this very well so it's easy for people that aren't used to reading statutes to understand. Okay, But let's go over some of the key points. Congress meets in a joint session on January 6th. The Senate and the House meet together. The vice president presides. They then have clerks open the envelopes containing the electoral votes. The vice president reads them, gives them to the clerks. They're recorded. You proceed alphabetically from Alabama, and you work your way down the list. What's our last state? Wyoming, I think. Don't quote me on that. If I'm wrong, I'm going to be terribly embarrassed, but I think it's Wyoming. So with the announcement, anyone can object for any reason. Now, the objection has to be in writing, signed by at least one representative and at least one senator. So Chuck Schumer and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez could both sign a written objection. Ted Cruz and Louis Gohmert could do the same thing, assuming Louis Gohmert is coherent enough to understand how his signature in basic English works. Point is, it's got to be in writing by at least one representative and at least one senator. And the reason why that matters is that you're going to see objections that are made on the floor orally without that writing. It happened in 2016. It happened in 2000, where Congress people get up and say they object for whatever reason because they're doing it for the cameras, not because it's a serious objection. A serious objection will be written down, signed by one representative and one senator, and then that gets submitted. So what happens when there's an objection? A couple things. First, under the same section, The joint session breaks. The Senate goes to their spot. The House goes to their spot. And independently, they decide what they want to do with the objection. And a very important piece of that is that all vote counting stops until the objection is resolved. So if you stop at Pennsylvania, you never get to Virginia or Wisconsin or Wyoming or anyone else. You never get there. You are paused at Pennsylvania until some kind of resolution happens. Now, what can that resolution be? That's something that each chamber decides on their own by a majority vote. Because remember, under Article 1, Section 5, they determine their own rules about their own proceedings. So what I did was I put together a table, and we're going to assume that the Senate wants to approve these electors no matter what. These are, these are bad Republican electors in states that Democrats won, and the Senate wants to approve them because they want Donald Trump in office. The The Electoral Count Act spells out what happens. So if both the House and the Senate approve, then the electors are approved. 
If the House says no, but the Senate says yes, there's what's called a tiebreaker provision, where if the governor has certified that is the correct slate, they count. The reason why that matters is, of course, back after the Civil War, you had issues with what is the true uh, elector slate for the given state. As part of the Electoral Count Act, the governor of the state has to certify that this particular slate is accurate. And so if the House says one thing, the Senate says something else, the, the governor is treated as the tiebreaker. Whichever slate the governor certified gets counted. But the big part that matters here is that if the House does nothing, they never make a decision, then you end up with a stalemate. Everything stops in perpetuity. Now, go back to that last section, that last sentence of Section 15. All counting is paused until the objection is addressed. If you never address the objection, nothing continues. Now, there are ways to limit that. Section 16 says that you can't recess. You have to handle this vote stuff. You're only allowed to recess until 10 o'clock the next day when you don't get it resolved. And if it goes on past a certain number of days, you can't even do that. You're supposed to stay in perpetual session. Section 17 limits the debate to two hours. But that's only the debate on the floor on what's called the main motion, the actual resolving of the thing. Before you get to that point, the House, because they control their own rules of procedure, can set up a select committee to talk about it, send the question to them, and then that committee never meets. You never get to the point where the House debates or the House votes. It just never happens. It takes a majority of that committee for something to take place. And if the committee screws around and you get to the point of filing what's called a discharge petition, the discharge petition needs a majority of the House to do that. There's nothing that can happen one way or the other without a majority of the House of Representatives agreeing to it. The Senate can't for force the House to vote. The Supreme Court can't force the House to vote. So then you get the question, what happens? Let's say that everything is frozen until January 20th. The House has been in this perpetual session, not doing anything, not really different from a typical Congress. And then we get to the point where under the 20th Amendment, the president's term has ended. Okay, let's talk about that. The 20th Amendment was ratified during the Great Depression because people thought Herbert Hoover was terrible. They elected FDR in a landslide. But it used to be you didn't get sworn in until March. And people decided that just was not going to do. So the 20th Amendment was passed. It shortened the lame duck period from March to January, moved it up two months also provided some contingencies for what happens if a president dies between election day and inauguration. There are a couple pieces here that matter for this particular election. Part one is that the president and vice president's terms both end on January 20th at noon. No exceptions. That is a hard-coded deadline in the Constitution that cannot be skipped. That is why re-elected presidents get re-sworn in again, as opposed to just allowing them to stick around for four years. They have to go back through the oath of office. And then Section 3 says that, you know, they go through these contingencies where if a president dies and so on, Section 3 gives Congress the power to decide what happens if there's no president and no vice president, what you do in that particular scenario. That leads to what is called the Presidential Succession Act. This is in the same portion of the United States Code right after the Electoral Count Act ends, Section 19. And it was enacted during the Cold War when we were concerned that the government might get nuked by the Soviets. So if you have watched Designated Survivor, that is it. This is the continuity of government plan. And so what happens if there's no president, no VP, there is a long list of government officials that become acting president. First in the line of succession is the Speaker of the House. The idea is that you want to have someone who's independently elected, not a cabinet officer. You don't want to have a president picking who their successor is going to be if something happens. So it's the Speaker of the House. The House is the legislative body closest to the people. So theoretically, the Speaker is the independently elected person closest to the people. Next on the list is the president pro tempore of the Senate, which usually is the longest serving senator. It's more of a ceremonial position because people just assume you'll never have the president and the vice president and the speaker all dead at the same time. And then you get into the cabinet secretaries. So every single cabinet department going in order of that department's seniority. So the first three cabinet secretaries are state, treasury and defense because they are the oldest. Uh, department of Justice is next. 
You go all the way to the end where it's the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Homeland Security because they were the most recently created. So you have this long chain of 30-ish government officials from the president on down so that if you keep killing people on the list and in some kind of terrorist act or whatever, there is someone somewhere who will still take over the government and become acting president so that we can continue. Now, the way that happens here is that if there are any hijinks at all with the electoral votes, any one representative can work with any one senator to file a written objection. And without a majority of the House to force the resolution to it, the entire process stops. It indefinitely stops. It seems crazy. It absolutely seems crazy, but that's what the law allows. And so if the process stays stopped past January 20th, when President Trump's term ends, when Vice President Pence's term ends, Whoever the Speaker of the House is, I'm assuming it's going to be Nancy Pelosi, but it could be someone else, they become acting president. They resign from Congress, they take over the duties of the president, and they stay in that job until there's some kind of resolution. Either two years from now, Republicans take over the House, four years from now there's a new presidential election, or the House and the Senate negotiate some kind of resolution between them. My guess is no one wants an acting president Pelosi on either side, so they would probably work something out. The House could, if they wanted to, make Joe Biden the Speaker. There is no requirement anywhere for the Speaker of the House to actually be a member of the House, as bizarre as that sounds. Every prior Speaker has been elected to Congress. You know, they've only picked from among themselves, but there's no actual requirement for that. They can pick Joe Biden. They can pick, you know, theoretically Barack Obama. They can pick, you know, uh, what's the guy's name? Burkow from the United Kingdom, the guy that used to be in Parliament. You know, they can pick Ronald McDonald. They can pick whoever they want. And that person would end up being acting president if nothing is resolved by January 20th. The Senate cannot force the House to make a decision before then. The Supreme Court cannot force the House to make a decision before then. There is nothing anyone else can do. Now, you never get to a contingent election if the House doesn't do anything. The 12th Amendment never comes into play if the House never does anything. So all of the videos, you know, about Republicans controlling more states doesn't matter because before you get to that point, as part of the vote counting, the House can just stop it all and basically play a game of constitutional chicken. Either you go with who won or you get acting president Nancy Pelosi. That's the gist of it. Now, a lot of folks think, isn't that crazy? And the short answer is no, because in every single government everywhere in the world, there is a last resort big boss that makes the decision when everything else fails. Now, some countries decide we want to have a dictator or a king or a president do that. Others decide we want to have that power in a court. For us, that power is vested in 535 independently elected members of Congress acting as a group. We decided, and by we, I mean, you know, my great, 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 great grandfather's elected representative, you know, decided that's how we were going to be structured. It's been that way for 232 years. No one's ever noticed because everything works normally most of the time, but that is how we are set up. Congress is the Article I branch of government. It is the first among equals. It has always been that way. That is their power to decide who is going to be the president. It's not crazy, I promise. So let's walk through some hypotheticals. I get this a lot on Twitter. You're just talking about the law. Coups are illegal. Guess what? It doesn't fucking matter. Because the fact is, there are multiple types of coups. You have a soft or legal coup where you're using the legal system to stay in office. It's not possible. It is not possible unless a majority of the House agrees to it. Now, if a majority of the House agrees to it and a majority of the Senate agrees to it, okay. That's on us for having terrible Congress people. It's never happened before. I don't think it will happen again. You know, But theoretically, that's possible. But without permission from a majority of the House, you never get to a soft coup. If we have a hard coup, tanks in the street, guns and ammo, the violent overthrow of the government, who won the election doesn't fucking matter. Absolutely does not matter, and there's no point in you stressing about electoral votes. If you actually think there are going to be tanks in the street to make Donald Trump president for four more years, the military's like, fuck yeah, we want four more years of this chaos. If you think that is going to happen, then shut off this video. There is no purpose in you watching this. Okay, next question. What happens if a bunch of Biden electors vote for Trump? So these are called faithless electors. First, 
there's not going to be any. Because remember, they are chosen by the political parties in coordination with the candidates. The only time you have faithful electors are when their vote doesn't matter. So in 2016, there were seven. You had five Democrats who voted for people that were not Hillary Clinton. Some voted for uh, Faith Spotted Eagle, who was a Native American activist. Some voted for Colin Powell. Uh, one voted for Bernie Sanders. You know, On the Republican side, you had one vote for John Kasich, and I, I don't remember the other one. But in both scenarios, there was such a huge gap between the two candidates in terms of electoral votes that it didn't matter. Those are the only times you get faithless electors is when their votes do not matter. No one switches from one to the other. You're not going to get Biden electors voting for Trump. It's just not going to happen. You might be able to convince Biden electors to vote for Bernie Sanders, I guess, but I doubt it. And even then, even if you had them potentially, Trump would have to flip 37 and you'll know ahead of time if that's going to happen. Because when the electors vote on December 14th, that's public knowledge. These are not secret ballots. The reason why it's public knowledge is because most states decided that they were going to enact laws dealing with faithless electors and that they invalidate their votes, they bring in new people, or they bring in the alternate to vote the way as they're pledged. But if those laws don't work, we're going through multiple layers of failures here. Let's say that people vote faithless. They vote for someone who is not who they pledged. They went ahead and they flipped. They're voting for Trump. 37 of them flip. We get to a tie. If somehow you have gotten this far down the chain of everything going not how it's supposed to go, you just have the Speaker of the House delay swearing in the Republicans. Swearing the Democrats on January 3rd when the Congress meets, say that we've heard allegations from Republicans about voting irregularities, have the Committee on Administration check it out, have your contingent election on January 6th after the electoral counting is done, repick Joe Biden as president, and then swear in the Republicans on January, 20, uh, January 7th. You can do all this very quickly and still end up with the exact same result that the election required. All right. What happens if Georgia, Michigan, or Pennsylvania, some legislature appoints their own slate of electors? This is the one that I mentioned, Jonathan Last, you know, the conservative guy who I love, says is going to happen. Even then, it doesn't matter because Congress starts counting the votes. When they get to PA or Georgia, or Michigan, or wherever, you file the written objection. The houses break apart to consider it. House refers the thing to a committee that never meets. And now come January 20th, the Speaker of the House becomes acting president. All right. What if a state doesn't appoint any electors at all? Well, in that scenario, they don't count towards the total. There are 538 electoral votes up for grabs. And the way that's apportioned, you have 435 uh, representatives, 100 senators, and then D.C. gets three. In this type of scenario where a state doesn't appoint electors, they're just removed from the total. So let's say Georgia refuses to appoint anybody. They don't appoint Trump electors. They don't appoint Biden electors. They just say, we're going to sit out this particular election then it's no longer a majority of 538. It's actually a majority of 522. So Joe Biden would only need 262 electoral votes to win, and he would still win. All right, what happens if the Supreme Court nullifies the election? It's not going to happen. The Supreme Court cannot nullify the election. There is no provision in the Constitution for a do-over of a presidential election. Trust me, I looked in 2016 when the Democrats were telling me that the Supreme Court was going to nullify the election. It cannot happen. If you doubt me on that, Back in 2016, there was a group called Revote 2020 or, or Revote 2016 or something like that, where they were raising money to take a case to the Supreme Court. It got dismissed. The Supreme Court never even heard it. The Supreme Court cannot nullify a presidential election. There is no power for them to do so. What if the Supreme Court decides the Electoral Count Act is unconstitutional? Guess what? They won't. The ECA has been used in every single presidential election since 1888. But even if they did, it doesn't matter. Because remember, before the ECA, Congress had absolute power over electoral votes. There was no consideration given to the rights of states. And that's the default that we go back to. Congress gets absolute power again. The ECA is a compromise that allows states time to sort out their own internal issues. If you throw out that law, Congress actually ends up with more power because that is how our government is structured. All right. What about McPherson v. Blacker? Case doesn't matter. The McPherson case says that legislatures get the power to appoint their electors under Article 2, Section 1, and basically says that power can't be diluted. You can't farm off the authority to appoint electors to the governor or to an administrative agency or to whatever else. It always is reposed in the state legislature. But that doesn't actually matter to what we're talking about, 
Because remember, Congress sets the deadline. If a state legislature appoints legislators now, those electors are late. That slate of electors picked by the legislature is late because it had to be appointed by election day. The state legislatures have changed the rules after the fact when they didn't like the results, and Congress can object to that and say, we're not going to recognize these because they're late, or more likely, just never make a decision one way or the other, and you end up with acting President Nancy Pelosi on January 20th. What about U.S. v. Throckmorton? This is one of the dumbest fucking things that I've seen in the past few days. It is a totally irrelevant case. I read it. I regret reading it. It's a case about land-grant contracts and invalidating a judgment because of fraud. It has nothing to do with elections. It is not applicable to anything elections-related. You cannot use something about a fraud in a judgment to invalidate an election because you pretend like fraud exists. It does not apply. Anyone who told you it applies is an idiot. Tell them that. What about all of the widespread fraud? Guess what? There was no widespread fraud. If there was, you'd see lawsuits about state legislative seats, about sheriffs, about district attorneys, not just the presidential race. And even if there were widespread fraud, which again, there wasn't, the Supreme Court can't do anything. None of the courts can do anything. Congress is the ultimate arbiter of deciding whether or not electoral votes are valid. What if all the litigation stops states from certifying their results? It's not going to happen. States certify on time unless slash until a court says they can't. And to get an injunction blocking certification, you have to have actual proof of fraud. Not what Rudy or Sidney or Jenna tells you on television actually offered in court proof of fraud. If any of you follow Mark Elias on Twitter, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. If not, I apologize to Mark. He has been tracking all of the legal cases that the Trump campaign and the Republican Party and their allies have filed. Guess what? They're losing everything. They won one tiny case about a small portion of votes in Pennsylvania that won't actually affect the outcome. They have lost everything else. There's something like one in 20 as of the time we're recording this. It will probably be more by the time you see this video. There is no widespread fraud. Get over it. What if Trump never concedes? Guess what? It doesn't matter. A concession has no legal effect. It's not required under the law. His term still ends. Now, is that a good thing to do from a political standpoint? Yes, it helps the country move on from the election. But it has absolutely no bearing at all on the fact his term is ending and the fact Joe Biden is taking over. What if the General Services Administration never declares Joe Biden president-elect? It doesn't matter. GSA provides money and office space during the transition. That's pretty much it. Things like the presidential daily brief and the national security stuff, that's up to the president. That's not up to GSA. The determinations that the GSA makes has no legal impact on who won the election. What about Executive Order 13848? This is something that Trump signed back in 2018, and I was banging my head on the desk that anyone would suggest this matters because I read that executive order. I regret reading that executive order. It has absolutely nothing to do with affecting election outcomes. What it says is that you have to do a report if there's evidence of foreign interference in elections, and you can freeze the assets of people who interfere. It can't block the Constitution. It can't block a law. It can't block the statutes on how electoral votes are counted. Anyone who told you that this executive order does anything is an idiot. Is there any scenario where Trump wins? No, but so-and-so I like said it was possible. That person is wrong, but blah, no. Joe Biden is going to be your president. I'm sorry if that causes you concern. There is no scenario, none, where this ends in a Republican. So some parting thoughts. Joe Biden won. He won the popular vote. He won the electoral college vote. Neither of those wins were close. Donald Trump got blown the fuck out. Sorry. Everything is going to proceed normally. That is my guess. Because, guess what? There is no scenario, none, where a Republican becomes president on January 20th unless a majority of the House agrees to it or you have tanks in the street. And if we end up with an overthrow of the government, what you can do is come visit me in the gulag and say, Greg, you were wrong. And so be it. But the fact is, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th president of the United States on January 20th. Okay? Okay. If you decide you want to contact me, This is my Twitter information. This is my uh, law firm Facebook page, my LinkedIn contact. I'll provide you links to all these in the notes underneath the video. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment or preferably, you know, mention me on Twitter, you know, send me an at. 
and I will respond. I'm, uh, I'm not a YouTube guy. If you are checking my channel, you'll notice there are not a whole lot of videos here. I really just am not a fan of YouTube, especially for anything law related. So if you have a question, feel free to comment, but better to hit me up on Twitter. Thank you for listening. Share this with your friends, particularly share the written stuff in the notes so that people can go read them. Let not your heart be troubled. Joe Biden will be the next president, no matter what your crazy uncle says on Facebook. Thank you for watching. Take care.